Um, and I'm going to share my screen. Are we ready to begin? We are begun. All right. Welcome but, to uh, David. Hang on one second. You can't yes, see sir. my screen yet, right? I can no, see it. I can see it. You can see can the see uh, the BAR. Yes, log. the introductory okay. introductory slide. Right. Okay. All right. Well, then we're good to go. And then make it. Then you want to make it full screen. Oh yeah. Right. All right, everyone. Welcome to the July twenty second, two thousand and twenty BAR large virtual meeting. My name is David Hazelden. The other board members present this afternoon are James Metter, Jay White, John Scott, and Ms. Luda Subchick. City staff present, the city architect Dennis Stout, and Alex Howell. The, the order of the meeting will be as follows. There will be an introduction, an overview of each project by the city staff to the board and for the public. Uh, following that will be applicant presentation. This will be limited to a 10 minute presentation, um, additional time, may be given by the chair. Any questions of the applicant by the board or staff can be addressed at that time. Any and all presenters should clearly state your name for the record. Any persons affiliated with a project, owners, developers, designers, consultants, etc., speak during this time period and portion of the um, presentation rather than the public comment portion. Um, following the applicant presentation will be that public comment uh, time period, which will be limited to the equivalent of the applicant's presentation. Uh, anybody speaking during the public comment presentation, please clearly state your name for the record um, so that we know who is speaking. City staff will then make comments and recommendations. Um, following those will be an applicant response or clarification to public comment and city staff comments and recommendations. This will be limited um, only to five minutes. Uh, following that will be board discussion and vote. Following items have been withdrawn or deferred. Number two, 54 St. Phillips. And number five, two Wharfside. Uh, please turn off any cell phones and um, any other devices. And please remember to limit this architecture only. Are there any comments from anybody before we begin? Yeah, I'd like to jump in very quickly and um and acknowledge a, a milestone event, uh, not only in the life of the City of Charleston Board of Architectural Review, but in the life and career of Dennis Dowd, our city architect. As many of y'all know, uh, Dennis will be retiring in August. And so this is his last appearance with us at BAR Large. And uh, that's worthy of recognition. Uh, Dennis has been in this position for a decade. And it's been one of the most um, intense and important decades in the modern history of the city. Dennis, you've been a huge part of that. And, you know, I know everybody on the board uh, wishes to commend you for a successful retirement, but on a personal note, you know, I've, you and I have worked together for eight years on this board and then professionally otherwise. And it's always been a pleasure for me. Uh, you've done a great job. You have every reason to be proud of the contribution you've made to the history of Charleston and the architecture of Charleston. And I'm proud to work with you. And I just want to say, job well done. Well, thank you, Jay. Uh, feeling is mutual for you and, and for everybody on the board. It's been an honor to be in this position. Uh, and, you know, it's, uh, it's 10 years is long enough <laughs> for anybody to do this. Uh, I, I figured I did over 250 BAR and DRB meetings <laughs> in that time frame, and that's a that's a long haul. But uh, it really has been an honor working with the various board members, and you guys do a great job. You give you know your personal time to this. I get paid for it, um, but uh, you know you do a terrific job, and the city owes you an absolute debt of gratitude for that. But I appreciate your your comments, Jay. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's just talk about meeting protocol here. Um, staff will control the PowerPoint presentation that includes everything submitted by the applicant by the deadline in accordance with the submittal requirements. 
applicants simply need to ask staff to advance to the next slide during your presentation. Applicants, staff, and board members are required to give their name whenever speaking, so please remember to do this. It's important for our recording. Uh, video and microphone have been disabled for all attendees, attendees being not board members or staff, and they'll only be given the capability to speak when they're called on during the public comment period. And the chat and the Q&A functions have been disabled for everyone for the meeting. Uh, during the public comment period, the applicants, including all team members, and the public have been required to register indicating the project they wish to comment on and submit any documents in advance of the meeting. And just as an in-person meeting, all applications heard today are part of a public meeting format. So if you've registered and will speak during the public comment portion of the meeting, you'll need to state your name and address for the record. Uh, those members of the public that have registered will be called in order by project. And members of the public that speak are encouraged to remain in the meeting for the completion of the item they have commented on in case the board has any questions. Uh, staff will call on the, on the registered members of the public to speak for each project. Unregistered members, however, who raise their hand will not be called on. Uh, we'd ask the board members should open the participants panel so that each board member can see the status of other board members' microphones and cameras. Board members will be polled by the chair for their vote on a motion. Each member, when voting, should respond yay in favor or nay, not in favor. And the chairman shall reread the motion verbatim, and the board member making the motion should correct the chairman if he's not reread the motion accurately. If a board member needs to recuse, he will be temporarily removed from the meeting and placed back in the meeting at the start of the next agenda item. If the board needs to go into executive session, they'll call into a separate conference line and all video and audio on Zoom will be temporarily turned off until they're ready to return to the regular meeting. That rarely happens. Um, we will issue, staff will issue meeting results, including staff comments and board motion to the applicant following the meeting. And those results will also be on the city website uh, and then for additional information, you can contact BAR at charleston-sc.gov or visit the city website. And finally, these proceedings are being recorded. And the first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes from the February 12th, 2020 meeting. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've reviewed those minutes and have no modifications to offer. All right. That's so, second. I will, yeah, I'll move for, I'll move for approval as submitted. <laughs> That's a motion for approval as submitted by Mr. White. Is there a second? I second. I second. All right, seconded by, I believe, Mr. Matter. I believe it was Mr. Scott. It was, it was yeah. Mr. Scott. I, I heard him, I think I heard him both at the same time. So the second by Mr. Leon Scott. Yeah. All right, so Mr. Mutters, how do you vote? Uh, I in favor. All right, Mr. Scott, how do you vote? I in favor. Uh, Ms. Sobchuk, how do you vote? Me in favor. And Mr. White, how do you vote? Yay, in favor. And David Hazelden, yay, in favor. The motion carries five to zero. Okay, next up is 54 St. Philip Street. Uh, I think Mr. White has to recuse on this, Alex, if you can remove him from the meeting temporarily. And let me know when that's accomplished. If you would, Alex, you Okay. Yeah, I just removed him from the meeting, so. Okay. Good. So this is 54 St. Philip Street requesting conceptual approval for new construction of an addition and renovation of the Simmons Center for the Arts, circa post 1976 in the old and historic district. And this is the uh, location of the project here on St. Philip Street uh, near Calhoun, between George and, and Calhoun. Um, this is a view looking north on St. Philip. Looking south 
on St. Philip. And we're talking about this portion of the structure here and this portion. I should note that uh, staff included the demolition of these existing wings as incidental to the renovation and addition of the Simmons Center, as we've done with you know, many other projects, including a few upcoming on this agenda. The building is not historic post-1976. Uh, um, we're looking across the street here. And then across the street, looking north with the, uh, the greenway on the left. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to the applicants for their presentation, Alex, if you can promote them to a panelist. I've promoted Andy Clark, and he can unmute himself. Can you hear me? We can. All right, well, thank you, Alex and Dennis. This is Andy Clark with Leo Leo Architecture. You're here seeking conceptual approval of the renovation in addition to the Simmons Center as stated. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to request the full 20 minutes if possible, given the scale of this project. Hopefully we won't need that time. Sure, well, let's get, let's get going and we can see how much time we may need, or may need. all right? All right, thank you. Uh, so a brief overview, this, this building is an important interface for the students of the college as up to 80% of the students will take a class in this facility at some point during their career. But in addition, it's also a very important public interface as both student performances and Spoleto performances within this facility attract a lot of visitors to the facility. So it's a very important project to the college as well as the city. It's been over 40 years without significant improvements to the project. So there are a lot of deferred maintenance uh, issues that we will be addressing with this project as well as upgrading the facility to the current trends in arts education and modernizing the classrooms. Uh, the addition that will be a part of this project is including a formal lobby space for the event spaces, as well as a new black box theater, and <clears throat> also a new central energy plant to support the mechanical needs. I'd like to say you know, this has been a very collaborative process. I'd like to thank the college faculty of the School of the Arts, as well as facilities, as well as our design partner, HGA Architects, who can bring a lot of arts expertise for higher ed to this project. Just quickly, a few of the main overarching goals of this design. One, to be deferential to Randolph Hall, obviously a very significant building across the street in height, scale, and mass. And also to be referential to the existing Simmons Center, which is a late century modernist building uh, from 1976. And also to create a very clear entry for visitors that creates a proper response to the terminus of the greenway as you see in this view. Uh, so with that we can go to the next slide. Very briefly touch on the agenda for this presentation, go through the Sanborn maps and history of the site, and then through some of the demo plans and then finally the proposed plans and renderings. So starting with the Sanborn maps, you can see from 1888 to 1944, very little change in the immediate site. But what you do see is across the street, Randolph Hall going from a very modest college building into expanding over the years into the significant building and yard that it is today. And on the next slide, you start to see as we get into the 50s, some of the smaller buildings on this site have started to go away and the college is starting to expand. On the right, you see the Simmons Center overlaid on that 55 Sanborn map. And then we'll move into the immediate site and you can start to see some of those buildings, historic buildings starting to go away in the 50s. Uh, the evolution of the synagogue on the Cato Center site fronting Calhoun Street. So a historic aerial, this is 1943. You can see that this is a, a very residentially scaled parcel at the time, typical of that period. And then as you move into the next slide, 1993, you can see the Simmons Center has been added as well as some other higher density buildings for the college. And then finally, the current aerial shows the addition of the Cato Center that fronts Calhoun Street. And then we have the campus map, and this just shows you the density of the college buildings as the campus has grown, typical of what you would expect for an urban college campus. 
And then we always dig into the history of the site to, to see what, how it can inform the design. Uh, just some of the images of the Brish Shalom Synagogue that it's evolved in the early 1900s, several variations of that, as well as the Dr. Gabriel. Uh, these buildings have now been lost. Moving on to the next slide. And in the 70s, the college really started to expand. And you can see our site highlighted in the white. In the upper left corner, you can see the start of the construction of the Robert Scott Smalls Library. And on the next slide, you see another view of that library construction. And now on the top of the screen, you can see the parking area that was sitting on the Simmons Center site that is today. And on the next slide, I think you see the Rhodes Furniture Parking. And if you look in the background, you can see the fence to the cistern yard beyond. And there's my car. <laughs> And then in 73, the college began Maybank Hall construction, which completed the other side of Cougar Mall, as we know it today, which is a very popular student destination. You see our site in the lower left corner here. And then moving into the Simmons Center constructions from the late 70s, you can see it's a very modern, traditional steel frame structure with infill metal studs. And the next slide shows you another view of the courtyard with the fly, the fly shaft and the Francis Marion Hotel in the background. And this was a rendering of the proposed design at the terminus of the Greenway with the screen wall for signage. And then on the next slide, you can see a little bit closer view of that screen wall and you can start to see the landscape wall that forms an edge between the sidewalk and the sunken courtyard. And on the next slide, you see an aerial view that shows how that landscape wall and landscaping divides the pedestrian from the sunken courtyard as it exists today. Some existing photos, this is from the Greenway on the top as you approach. And one of the things we notice is that the screen wall there is a little bit off center and there's a column. And on the bottom two images, you see a view looking south on St. Philip and a view looking back north. On the next slide, we get into the photos from Randolph Hall. And this is within the cistern yard. And obviously it's a very heavily landscaped, beautiful area. On the northern end of the cistern yard, there's an opaque wall. So the Simmons Center is visible slightly through the trees, um, but it is a little bit obscured. And on the next slide, we show some more photos of the existing courtyard. Being a sunken courtyard in Charleston, they have experienced frequent flooding in this courtyard, uh, which has caused some maintenance issues and has been underutilized because of that fact. So those are some of the things we'll try to address in the design. And then an aerial of the site showing the Greenway, Cougar Mall, St. Philip, and buildings situated between Calhoun and George Street. And then we'll go into some existing site diagrams. And as we started to study this, we, we looked at the axes. On the next slide, you can see the axes and the entry points. Uh, there are five existing entry points, as you see by those five red arrows, uh, but none of them are really designated as the main entry point and none of them arrive at some kind of public lobby. Uh, so that's one of the things on the next slide, you the pedestrian circulation. And you can see as you approach from the Greenway, you reach that wall and you have to turn to go around to go into the building. And so we wanna to try to create a more intentional terminus of that Greenway. On the next slide, I think you'll see as the building has been reoriented, you terminate right into a canopy that leads you into the new lobby space. Okay, next slide. So this shows the proposed diagrams. Uh, there are two additions. I'll start with the three-story addition on the top of the screen. That's adjacent to the fire lane, and that's twofold purpose for that. One, one wanted to get more program away from St. Philip Street and away from Randolph Hall. Uh, it's also to support a central energy plant. So by adding a third floor above the existing two-story portion, we're able to keep the volumes on St. Philip Street to two stories and tuck the mechanical systems out of view from the public way. The two-story renovation and addition along St. Philip Street allow for the new black box theater and allow the courtyard to stay as a terminus to the Greenway. And then the vehicular circulation study, it is currently one way in front of St. Philip Street. We understand that there's potential for that to change to two-way in the future. 
And then on the east side, top of the screen is the fire lane access on the back for the loading area to the, the sculpture studio. These next slides just were included for reference. So Alex, we can skip through these very quickly. Uh, floor plans provided for reference. If you can go to the demo plans and we can briefly talk about those. So here are the demolition level one. So the hatched areas show you the areas of demolition and then the red dashed lines show you more interior demolition for the renovation portion. As you go up to the second floor, you can see again the two hatched areas that are the full demolition with the remainder being interior demolition for renovation purposes. And then on the third floor, you can and see- is, is this not part of the second? Yes, so, so that area is demolition of the walls, but retaining the structure. So okay. that's why it's not hatched. Okay. Thank you. On level three, you see the two low roofs hatched to be removed and some interior renovations. And then on level four, it's all interior renovations to reconfigure the spaces. And then up to the high roof plan, the three high roofs remain as is. So then moving to the landscape plan, this is in collaboration with outdoor spatial design. Uh, the main purpose of the landscape design is to bring the courtyard up to grade and provide direct access from the sidewalk into the courtyard, uh, providing some trees for shade during the hot months, using a, a native plant palette and having seasonal varieties of those, providing bench seating for student collaboration and, and an urban space, as well as permeable pavers to improve the stormwater. I'll note that this design has progressed and we're continuing to progress that uh, in the last three months and look forward to developing that further into the next submittal. Andy, I'll let you know that you're 10 minutes in at this point. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Uh, we can go quickly through the floor plans, the overall first floor plan. On the next page, you can see a zoom in to the black box and lobby as you enter through the new courtyard into the lobby space and the black box theater on your left. And then on the next slide, you can see the south end of the first floor, the pink area being two new active learning classrooms for the arts management department, as well as a laptop bar that can double as a box office for events in the lobby space. Next, you can go to the overall second floor plan and move to the zoom in. You can see the black box is open to below, a costume shop adjacent to that. And on the next slide, more traditional classrooms for the art history department in the yellow, as well as a theater design studio in the purple to the right. And then as you go up to the third floor, you can zoom in to the next slide. The upper left portion is the new, where you have two new music classrooms, as well as a drawing and painting classroom in green with independent study areas. And on the next slide, you see a renovation of the art history lecture hall as well as repurposing art history faculty offices and seminar spaces. The fourth floor, you can go to the next slide. The north tower is the new printmaking suite being completely repurposed. And then on the next, and also the central energy plant is there above that. And on the south end, the arts management faculty recording booth, seminar and collaboration areas. So here you see the roof plan, the hatched area is the existing and the white area is the new. Moving to the next slide, you can go through these two enlargements. And you can go through, these were the existing elevations, existing streetscape studies showing the scale of the proposed along St. Philip as two story relative to the surrounding buildings, and then the opposite side of the street with the Greenway and Randolph Hall. And then the exterior finishes, the existing Simmons Center is masonry, and that's what we're proposing as the primary uh, material for the new addition. We'd like it to be a complementary but differentiated brick color. We're going through many studies to determine what that best color is. Uh, powder coated aluminum thins for the sunshade at the lobby area. Uh, they're multicolored to reflect the arts inside. 
and then a glazed brick accent at the angled window returns, which is a, also as a reference to the existing Simmons Center angled windows, but also a reference to the green shutters of Randolph Hall across the street. And then the color palette was very important. The city of Charleston and the college both have a history of, of bright desaturated colors. And so we've studied the immediate context of Randolph Hall and the Greenway to inform the color palette for those fins. And then we can quickly go through the exterior elevations, the black box theater. Next slide shows the classrooms along the south. And then the south elevation, the hatched area is existing Simmons to remain with a two-story addition fronting St. Philip Street. And then an overall elevation of the alley. We can go to the enlarged, the existing fly shaft to remain and Robinson Theater, and then the rebuilt sculpture and scene shop with studios above with living access as well. Building sections quickly through the black box on the left, the scene shop on the right facing the alley with the existing Simmons Center sandwiched in between. And then another section through the lobby and courtyard area with the Robinson Theater existing on the right. We did study the sight lines. We, we do not have any mechanical equipment in this area, but they are fairly well protected. And this is a bird's eye view showing the entire massing, the two-story portion running St. Philip Street and the taller version stepping back from the road. And then finally, a few renderings. Uh, on this rendering, you're standing in the greenway and you can see how the canopy comes out to align with the greenway and welcome you into the building. Uh, the goal was to have as much transparency into the lobby to showcase the student work. On the left, you can see the black box theater, which is naturally a windowless space. So we've broken up the scale by providing bench seating at the grade level and a faceted wall that's an accent color of glazed brick. And that's a, a abstract reference to a stage curtain as the wall juts in and out. Um. Mr. Chairman, that's 15. I presume you want to give them more time. Uh, I'll give them about two minutes to wrap up. Okay, we've got three slides. Getting towards the end of the presentation anyway, it sounds like based on those comments. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, this view is looking north on St. Philip from near the cistern yard. Uh, one note to show here is that the angled windows uh, alternate from the first floor to the second floor. So those color accents of the glazed brick will allow pedestrians when mm. walking north or south to get a glimpse of color as they walk down the street. And on the next slide, a close up of the courtyard area, which is again in progress, but trying to create something at grade that's more active and part of the public realm in the existing sunken courtyard. And the next slide takes you inside the lobby. You can see as you come through the vestibule, this Doubles as a student commons during the day, but can be a, a pre-function space for events at night. You can imagine the music students performing in a three-piece band on the mezzanine. And on the next slide, you look back down, a visual connection to the campus, directly down the greenway to place the students within the context of where they are. And then finally, as important, the dust view. Uh, this transparency allows the lobby to glow at night and become a beacon for the arts and really invite people to come into these performances. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you for the additional time. Yes, sir. Thank you. Are there any um, questions of the applicant? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, this, this is James. The reference to colors, Andy, on the existing structures throughout campus, I agree that those are uh, significant, not just to those structures, but to the campus itself. You, you, you don't have as a goal to actually take any of those colors and actually use those colors on the new building. You're, you're looking to find something that, that blends in with that color palette. Uh, that would be the color palette for the proposed uh, sunshades in front of the curtain wall of the lobby. So it's a series of alternating colors and that was the inspiration. At this point, that's our you know, conceptual idea that will be developed further into the preliminary design.
Thank you. Are there any, any other questions? I have one, Mr. Chair. Um, Andy, do you plan to reincorporate the plaque on the existing St. Philip Street wall? Yes, we do. Uh, we've, we've identified it and we're studying ways that we can incorporate it intentionally, but haven't gotten to that level yet. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Hearing on public comment on this project. Yes, we have two speakers from the public. Um, we have Will Hamilton. I will turn on his microphone and he can unmute himself. Thank you, Alex. Uh, this is Will Hamilton with Historic Charleston Foundation. I just want to start by thanking the applicant for reaching out to us to discuss this plan ahead of this afternoon's hearing. Uh, Historic Charleston feels this is a well-conceived design that's much more welcoming at the St. Philip Street entry. With the inclusion of the colored aluminum fins and angled glazed bricks at the base of the building and around the window openings at the south facade, this building comes across as one dedicated to the arts, as it should. The changes don't overwhelm the design from a scale and massing perspective in the general architectural direction that suits the building's various uses. The only item we would like to see refined at the preliminary approval stage is the signage facing St. Philip Street. We would prefer to see School of the Arts spelled out on the south side rather than incorporating uh, S-O-T-A there. So overall, we feel this design is headed in the right direction and are comfortable uh, recommending conceptual approval. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? We have one more, uh, and that's Erin Minigan, and she can unmute herself. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Erin uh, Minigan, Preservation Society of Charleston. The Preservation Society uh, appreciates the applicant reaching out to us on this project and is very supportive of the architectural direction. Specifically, the touches of color, integrated benches, and inviting courtyard will allow for the building to engage with the public realm far more than it does currently. While we are comfortable with conceptual approval, we would present comments on the material palette for consideration in the next level of review. First, it will be critical to select a brick that is complementary yet distinct from the existing building, and we do not feel the red-orange tone brick that's pictured on page 61 and rendered on pages 74 through 76 is an appropriate color choice and should be further, uh, further studied. Also, we like the idea of the colorful fins at the entry bringing warmth to an otherwise severe building and feel the materials uh, should support that. We are concerned that powder-coated aluminum may read as cold and flat and feel a more transparent material such as glass would have more success. Thank you. Thank you. Is that, does that wrap up public comment, Ms. Howe? Yes. All right. And just a quick FYI, I think my computer froze, so I'm going to log out and back in, but I'll be right back. 